Hello and welcome everybody to today's webinar on vehicle procurement for safety, passive safety systems. My name is Sarah Plum and I'm the Senior Fleet Officer, part of the Global Fleet Team here at Break, the Road Safety Charity, where we work with fleet operators and suppliers to share resources and best practice across the industry. You should all now be able to see my presentation and hear the audio alongside it. As attendees, you're all muted, so you don't need to worry about any background noise from your offices. Passive safety systems can have a significant impact on fleet safety by protecting occupants and other road users in crashes. Today's webinar will explain the features of the latest passive safety systems available and will provide guidance on how to choose vehicles that maximise the safety of both vehicle occupants and vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians and cyclists. Our speakers today are Julian Carroll, Vehicle Safety and Technology Consultant at TRL and Dr. Richard Frampton, Senior Lecturer in Vehicle Safety at Liverpool University. Both of today's presentations are pre-recorded, but I'm delighted that Julian and Richard are joining us live today to answer any questions you may have. There are two ways to put forward your questions to us. Firstly, there is a chat box on the webinar panel where you can send your question at any point during the webinar. Alternatively, there is a raise hand icon on the same panel. You can press this during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentations, and we will unmute you and you can put your question to the panel and directly over the phone. Before we start with the first presentation, I just want to take the opportunity to give you a very brief overview of Break, who we are and what we do. Set up and founded in 1995, Break is a national road safety charity that exists to stop the needless deaths and serious injuries that happen on roads every day. Make streets and communities safer for everyone and care for families bereaved and injured in road crashes. Break's vision is quite simple, a world that has zero road deaths and injuries, and a world where people can get around in ways that are safe, sustainable, fair and healthy. We promote road safety awareness, safe and sustainable road use, and effective road safety policies through campaigns, community education, information and advice for organisations operating fleets of vehicles, and road safety professionals. And of course, by running the UK's flagship road safety event, Road Safety Week which takes place in November every year. We also provide essential support to people across the UK devastated by road death and serious injury to help them in their darkest hours. So in terms of support, we run a quality accredited free phone helpline in the UK for people bereaved and seriously injured in road crashes. You can see some information on the level of support we gave in 2017 on your screen now. In addition to the helpline, we also provide support literature and work very closely with police forces throughout the UK so that when someone does receive that knock on the door from a family liaison officer, they are providing them with best practice support literature. We campaign nationally and regionally to, to raise awareness among the public and to lobby government and push for change in road safety legislation. An example of this is our 2016 Roads to Justice campaign which centred around getting justice for bereaved families. This UK campaign launched outside Parliament and gained a lot of media attention, and I'm sure most of you will have seen the changes to criminal driving sentencing announced in October 2017. We also do a lot of campaigning more generally on raising awareness of a range of topics, some of which you can see on the screen now. Awareness raising and education in communities is delivered through projects such as our Beep Beep Days. Each year, Break helps hundreds of companies run road safety projects in their communities and inspire children to be safe on our roads. We have well established events and resources to help you run activities locally to your business. Our community engagement team can help put you in touch with local schools and nurseries and give you advice on how to talk to different age groups. Or your company can work with Break to establish your very own community project. We have two main projects this year, our Beep Beep Days, for two to seven year olds, and Breaks Kids Walk for four to 11s. Details are on your screen or contact us for more information. We also share training tools and guidance on global fleet safety, best practice for our Break Professional Membership Service. We provide our members with tools to manage occupational road risk, regardless of budget, fleet size or vehicle type. We run an annual calendar of events, including webinars such as today's and seminars and training throughout the year. 
We also have annual flagship events such as our Fleet Safety Conference and Fleet Safety Awards. In addition to these events, we also produce a lot of resources for employers, including guidance reports on introducing policies and sharing best practice case studies. Alongside that, we provide employers with tools to use directly with their drivers. As you can see on screen now, some of the posters, infographics and videos you can use to engage our own drivers. If you have any questions or would like to find out how you can get more involved with us here at break, please let us know. So on to today's webinar. The presentations today will last for approximately 60 minutes and as I referred to earlier, there will be plenty of time to ask any questions at the end, should you have them. Without further ado, we'll start the first presentation now. So I'll hand you over to Julian Carroll at TRL. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. Um, my name's Jolien Carroll and I'll be introducing these passive safety talks with a few minutes about occupant restraint systems and then in the second half a few more minutes about vulnerable road user protection. But here's a short video to start things off with restraint systems. So given that we're all likely to have grown up around government initiatives and think campaigns encouraging seatbelt wearing, um, there'll be no surprise really that I'm going to spend some time talking about seatbelts and click. click. Um, beyond that, I do have a few points about airbags. I'll then um, introduce some mandatory requirements for cars before moving back around to consumer information and consumer choices. So apart from some pretty wild ideas, such as self-fastening belts, uh, seat belts have been key component of occupant restraint systems for the last 100 years or so. Modern three-point lap and diagonal belts have been with us for about 60 years. And the effectiveness of a wearing a seat belt varies in the literature, depending on things like the severity of the injury being considered. It's generally a smaller number for slight injuries and most effective in preventing fatal injuries. At that most severe level, an effectiveness of 45 or 50% is usually given. So that your risk of dying in a car collision is halved by wearing a belt. Here are some facts about seatbelts from the government's website. Um, young drivers and passengers are least likely to wear a belt, but importantly, most likely to crash. And seat belts are used least frequently for short, familiar journeys. From the legal side, we know that failure to buckle up is breaking the law. And if you're caught, this will result in a fine. So given that seat belts are so crucial for occupant restraint, what can we do to ensure belt wearing? And this is where seatbelt reminders can help us with a visual and audible warning in case we've forgotten to do up the belt. Now these systems are mandatory for driver's seats in cars. There is also a proposal to extend this cover to all seats in cars and vans and for the front seats in heavier vehicles. Uh, on the right hand side there have given a useful reference for their effectiveness. It comes from a European belt wearing study where they noticed that the effect of having a Euro NCAP compliant seatbelt reminder was to decrease the proportion of unbelted drivers by approximately 80%. In modern restraint systems the seatbelt is usually fitted with complementary pretensioners and load limiters. Pretensioners are usually pyrotechnic devices, or perhaps they can be retractor systems that take in slack from the seatbelt in the event of a crash. This also helps to position the occupant closer to a design or the ideal place for engaging the restraint system. Once the belt is tight, then a load limiter allows the seatbelt to pay out during a collision. This reduces the force going through the belt, 
and balances the contributions from the belt and the airbag. By paying out belt, there can be increased use of the available space in front of an occupant and hence lower forces on their body. Whilst these systems are not an option you can choose to buy, I hope that it gives you an idea that they enable restraint system designers to have the tools with which they can optimize the performance of the system. Now, with airbags, well, we have the Mercedes S-Class released in 1980 to thank for airbags in Europe. Um, this side of the Atlantic, airbags were implemented to complement the seatbelt and Im improve the restraint system performance. In the US, um, belt wearing could not be mandated at a federal level, and so instead they had to introduce the, them as an effort by NHTSA to protect unbelted occupants. Um, on that basis, claims for airbag safety in the states are that um, between 1987 and 2015, frontal bags have saved almost 45,000 lives, enough to fill a major league ballpark. In Europe, effectiveness is more difficult to judge given mutual contributions of belt and bag. Um, however, one thing I would say is that we've seen a marked reduction in the number and severity of head and face injuries here since the widespread introduction of airbags. I think generally it's safe to say that the combined system with seatbelt and airbag offers the best possible restraint for an occupant. So if airbags are so good, then how many should we look for? Um, most people seem to know about the airbag in the steering wheel or in front of the front seat passenger. But mo many modern systems include additional bags in the lower dashboard to protect the knees and the legs. Sometimes airbags are fitted in the seat base to prevent the pelvis from sliding forwards. In side impact, airbags are used routinely to protect the head of the front seat occupants and particularly since the introduction of the pole test within Euro NCAP. You also see chest protection airbags included in the seat backs, and equivalent airbags are available for the rear seats in some cars, and that's being encouraged now. So you may have gathered from the way I've been talking about these restraint system components that the, the precise elements within them are not required by legislation in Europe. Instead, we have a series of regulatory requirements that set minimum system performance in a technology agnostic way. So examples of that are full scale frontal and side impact tests. There are also requirements for seats based on their geometry, their dimensions and, and their strength. Coming soon will be another frontal test, a full width test, a side impact pole test, and dynamic assessment of seats for rear impacts. Here is a video from a full width frontal test to give you a feeling of what happens in those events. By way of commentary, um, the airbag starts deploying within the first 20 milliseconds, that's 1 50th of a second. It's fully inflated by 50 milliseconds, that's 1 20th of a second. The head has started being controlled by the bag by about 70 milliseconds, and peak loading is over by uh, 100 milliseconds, one tenth of a second. And the whole event that has been shown there takes about half a second. This really is blink and you miss it stuff. The picture I put up is a, just an old gem that I came across showing that this kind of testing is in no way new, but the energy management is very different within a, a modern vehicle. So complementing the regulatory requirements are tests done by Euro NCAP. These provide consumer information about vehicle safety and represent something more like a carrot than a stick for the industry. In particular, we get the, that full width frontal uh, and the side impact pole tests that are soon to come into legislation already. There are also dynamic seat tests for whiplash protection. We are <coughs> In addition, we learn about child occupant protection in the rear seats, child seat fitment, 
and other details about safety systems on the on the vehicle. This is an image, a snapshot from the Euro NCAP website. It's illustrating the way the results are presented. Here we've got <clears throat> um, a recent car uh, with a pretty good performance. A sliding scale is used for each body region to turn the test results into a rating. Green is good and red is poor. So here is another recent example of a test result from Euro NCAP with worse performance. You can see there's a bit more brown and, and orange going on for that car. OK, now I'm going to change direction slightly and move on to talk about pedestrian or vulnerable road user protection. Again, I've got a little uh, video to show to what a pedestrian collision might look like. So in this part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about protection systems for pedestrians and vulnerable road users. Um, in particular, I'm considering secondary safety measures, te technologies that act with, within the crash event, unlike autonomous emergency braking, which may be extremely effective for pedestrian protection, but acts before the collision rather than within that event. So for this, it's mostly brackets and frangible elements, breakaway components, perhaps not so glamorous. However, there have been some fanciful concepts along the way, like Lorora. Um, British Leyland also had a similar system, the idea for trying to catch a pedestrian with a bar that came up from the bonnet. But it was relatively early in the, the research process that the decision was taken to treat pedestrian safety testing with subsystem or component tests. The advantage is that if you break it up into these components, each test type can be more repeatable and more reproducible than driving the, a car into a pedestrian dummy. Instead, the, in this case, the test tools are fired into the vehicle. And of these tests, the, the full leg form and the head form tests have made it into United Nations and European regulations. In the United States, um, a recent study suggested that bringing their fleet up to state-of-the-art protection would result in 27% decrease in deaths to pedestrians hit by cars. I think the claims here made alongside the regulations are more conservative than that. Uh, an effectiveness value of between 1% and 5% is proposed for pedestrian fatalities, depending on the country. This rises to about 12% when looking at serious injuries. But unfortunately, the numbers are even less impressive when you switch to consider pedal cyclists, maybe 1% and 5% for fatal and serious injuries, respectively. And that reflects the different collisions and contact types between pedestrians and pedal cyclists. So here again is a video, an example of a leg form test to the center of a bumper. And some of the things it shows are how modern cars are designed to give similar contact times for the upper bumper and lower spoiler. Um, this is intended to reduce the bending of the lower leg and knee. Let's just play that again for you. Deformable and energy absorbing elements are used in the vehicle front in order to manage the loading severity of the event. And generally the behavior of the leg form is representative of a whole body of a pedestrian for, for modern cars. That's during the loading event, the loading phase of the event. We don't lose too much by not considering the upper body. However, there are some limitations to that statement, particularly in rebound when the leg form bounces off or in contacts around the edges of vehicles, and particularly for off-roaders or SUVs with high bumpers. So as mentioned, design solutions for pedestrian protection tend to manifest themselves in the use of deformable or frangible elements, brackets and hinges. Energy absorbing foams are used in the front of the bumper beam. There's an overarching initiative to distribute forces over wide areas or several elements to avoid a single stiff component being struck. 
this isn't always possible. So sometimes you see manufacturers looking towards pop-up bonnets or perhaps even airbags around the windscreen edge to protect parts which are difficult to soften otherwise. When we get to the consumer inf information testing within Euro NCAP, then this is how the results are typically presented. Here again is our good car from before and here is our less good car from before and you'll notice that the difference is quite difficult or much less obvious for these two cars. As a general observation there have been improvements over time in pedestrian safety measures without doubt um, but the influence of the driving factors, the extent of those changes, the, their effectiveness is, is harder to judge for pedestrian safety than for occupant safety. We haven't yet seen the same radical changes in injury outcomes that we saw with the introduction of steering wheel airbags, as an example. So without dwelling on, to the, dwelling on the detail, I'm going to move on and just start summarising this by talking about some of the things that I think are important when it comes to choosing a car and what to look for. So as a start, we have some mandatory requirements built around crash tests and some system and seat tests. These establish a minimum level of performance for mainstream cars in Europe. Supplementing that is the consumer information which we have for popular models of car and, and some vans. This allows us to differentiate safety performance in various crash configurations. Neither of those driving forces stipulates passive safety component fitment, rather they require overall system level performance. So therefore, as a consumer, we're not really able to pick and choose the safety system components, but we are able to choose cars based on their occupant restraint system and their pedestrian protection performance. If you were thinking about heavier vehicles, the process is similar. We have some minimum performance requirements in the legislation. <clears throat> However, what we're missing here is the consumer information. So this leaves us in the position where we might have to fall back on um, vehicle specifications and choosing vehicles by the presence or absence of certain key components. And with that, it concludes my talk. So it just remains for me to thank you for listening and thank you for your time. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Julian, and much appreciated. I'm sure you'll all agree that was a great start to today's session and um, very informative with lots of interesting stats and plenty for us all to think about. Don't forget if you have any questions you can submit them at any time during the webinar and um, just use the chat box on the webinar panel on your screen. I would now like to introduce you to Dr Richard Frampton from Loughborough University for the next presentation. Thank you. What we're going to look at in this short presentation is how to procure the safest vehicles and at future developments in crash testing. Now, crash testing is important because it forms the basis for many of the available safety rating systems that are available uh, to look at. In terms of understanding safety rating systems, it's probably best if we just recap on how occupants are injured in a crash and what are the main protective systems that are used to reduce injury risk. Now, this phrase here, it's not speed that kills, but the sudden stop, sums up really the main problem with automotive crash injury. Let's just take a look at an example as a way of explaining that statement. So consider a vehicle traveling at 64 kilometers an hour, that's about 40 miles an hour, and it hits a wall and comes to a stop. The front of the vehicle is overlapped by about 40%. And in a modern vehicle, in that type of impact, you will get a front end crush on the vehicle of about two thirds of a meter. And the vehicle will stop in 100 milliseconds. That is 0.1 of a second. That is uh, about twice as fast as you can blink. So everything happens very fast. But the occupant inside the vehicle stops even faster, and this is the problem. So imagine in this vehicle you have an unbelted occupant, uh, and that occupant will carry on moving at 64 kilometers an hour once the car starts to slow. 
The occupant will only slow down and stop once they hit the vehicle interior. Now, as an example, imagine uh, the occupant's head. A human head is about five kilograms in weight. It's traveling at 64 kilometers an hour and it will stop when it hits some part of the vehicle interior, for example, the A pillar, which is here. Now, imagine the head stops in 18 milliseconds. That's 0.018 of a second. You can calculate the deceleration on the head from a simple formula, velocity divided by time. So it's the traveling speed, which is 64 kilometers an hour or 17.88 meters per second, divided by 0.018 of a second, which works out to be 101 G. So 101 times the force of gravity on the head. So human head can't actually cope with that kind of load. And uh, if that were a real person in that car, they would probably have fatal head injuries. Now the force on the head, you can work out from the mass times acceleration. And you can see here the mass uh, is five kilograms. Acceleration is 993 meters per second squared. So that's five kilonewtons of force going through the head. So this is the reason why occupants are injured in car crashes, because of the rapid stop. Uh, now, every body part uh, moves in its own deceleration field. And what this means is that uh, every body part will slow at different rates, depending on how heavy that body part is and what it hits in the interior of the vehicle. So it follows that the key to occupant protection is to lengthen the time over which you slow the occupant down inside the car. Now, on that basis, how do we protect car occupants in a crash? Well, we first need to prevent interior contact altogether if we can, and that's the job of the seatbelt and the airbag systems. The seatbelt holds the occupant in place and prevents excessive movement inside the car. We need to increase the ride down for any contact areas that the occupant might possibly impact. And this is the job of the airbag and uh, any energy absorbing material that we can line the interior with. We can prevent ejection from the vehicle. Ejection from the vehicle uh, is quite important because uh, research shows that if you're thrown out of the vehicle, your risk of dying is magnified 10 times. So the seat belt, uh, laminated, glass windscreens, anti-burst door locks are there to stop the occupant being thrown out of the car. And if we can attach the occupant to the vehicle as quickly as possible uh, once the crash starts, we can allow the occupant to ride down on the slow, slow down time of the vehicle. So this gives them more time to slow down. And of course, we need to maintain the uh, passenger's compartment zone, the occupant survival space, because this again, gives us a little bit more room for the occupant to move before striking the interior. So all of this adds up to increasing the ride down time, increasing the time it takes to stop from the initial traveling velocity. Now, vehicle crumple zones and rigid passenger compartments ensure that the, the vehicle dissipates all of the crash energy and maintains the occupant survival space. Now, the problem occurs <clears throat> if the passenger compartment starts to collapse in a crash. Uh, because, as you see on the left, some uh, major intrusion, uh, any collapse of the passenger compartment, as you see here, increases the chance that you're going to hit the inside of the car. Uh, the contact with the inside occurs before the restraint systems have had much chance to slow the occupant down. And generally, this type of damage uh, occurs at high crash speeds and results in quite aggressive uh, interior structures, the plastic splits, the metal tears, and so on. So we don't want this to happen. So the job of the vehicle structure is to prevent this so-called intrusion. Now in a side impact, we've got an even bigger challenge because the occupant is sitting right next to the point of impact. And all there is really between the occupant and the incoming vehicle or lamppost or whatever the object is, is a thin sheet steel door and possibly uh, a door bar like you see here. So the occupant uh, restraint systems don't have much time to work. And in addition, we don't have one meter of vehicle structure between the occupant and the impacting object as we do in a frontal crash. All we have really are some uh, a B pillar and a sill 
and an A pillar. So there's not a lot of structure there uh, to introduce ride down for the occupant. Okay, so those are the basics. Uh, how do we measure crash safety performance? How do you know your crash protection systems work? Well, in most motorized countries around the world, there are minimum legal requirements uh, that a vehicle has to pass before it can be sold. And you can see um, some of those requirements illustrated here. Uh, they do differ uh, in different parts of the globe, but these are um, pass-fail tests that the manufacturer has to undergo before the vehicle can be sold. Now, they don't actually score the safety performance of a car. As I say, they just give you a pass or fail. So in that sense, they're not much help when you're trying to choose a vehicle for safety. So how do you find out how well crash systems, crash protection systems perform? Well, to do that, we need to go to consumer safety testing. Now these are in addition to the legally required crash tests and they provide a score for safety showing how well the vehicles actually perform in a crash. Manufacturers don't have to do these tests, they're completely voluntary, but most good manufacturers will put their cars through consumer testing because safety sells. And these uh, consumer tests are sponsored usually by national governments and non-governmental motoring organizations. There are a variety of them around the world. Most come under the auspices of Global NCAP, Global New Car Assessment Program. As you can see here, they, um, some are not under the auspices of Global NCAP. Uh, one example would be the tests carried out by the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety in the United States. The point to, to uh, note here is that not all these countries run the same tests. So you need to look at the country in which you're purchasing the car and look at the tests that are run in that particular country to get a good picture of, of how the vehicle performs. Now, the, the basic philosophy of consumer testing is, of course, to publish safety performance scores, which means that as a customer, uh, it's possible to choose the safest vehicles, and this is important. And the consumer test programs are, are usually based on legal testing procedures, but using more searching procedures in order to expose the difference between cars that have good safety and cars that have bad safety. Now, what do I mean by searching procedures? Well, if you look at the frontal impact test carried out by the European New Car Assessment Program, Euro NCAP, uh, what we see is a similar test to the legal requirement, but it's carried out at a higher speed. So it's carried out at 64 kilometers an hour instead of 56. And this equates to a 30% increase in the crash energy that needs to be dissipated. In terms of the crash test dummies that are used, uh, the same body regions, head, neck, chest, femur, and lower leg, are assessed, um, that are assessed in legal testing. But Euro NCAP adds some extra body regions. So they also, in addition, assess the risk of injury to the knee and to the foot and ankle. The Euro NCAP side impact test is the same as the legal requirement in Europe, but it uses a heavier crash barrier, uh, which makes the test more severe. And it also uses uh, a different dummy, a more sophisticated dummy uh, in the front seats called WorldSID instead of the EuroSID 2. Euro NCAP carry out an impact into a pole to assess head protection in a severe side impact. So this would be the type of crash you would have into a lamppost or a tree if the vehicle's spinning off the road. And um, this test is not carried out as part of the legal requirement in Europe. Only NCAP does this. So uh, one more, uh, your NCAP assesses whiplash protection in rear impact. Uh, this is not done uh, for the legal requirement either. So what you can see is that generally these consumer tests are more severe and more searching than any of the legal requirements. Now, most consumer testing around the world uh, base their uh, protection scores on similar criteria. Uh, the major part of any safety rating is usually uh, based on the forces and loads recorded by the crash test dummy in a crash. 
and generally the organizations look at the uh, rigidity of any possible contact points on the interior of the car they look at how the dummy moves in the car and whether the dummy has a good stable contact on the airbag for example uh, in some types of crash the dummy doesn't have a good contact and the head rolls off the airbag so this is potentially dangerous um, vehicle structural performance is examined to see whether the vehicle has any intrusion whether the doors can still open after the crash and so on and of course the level of safety equipment supplied by the manufacturer is taken into account now in terms of uh, using dummy loads and accelerations to give an injury risk uh, assessment uh, typically uh, the dummy is presented in terms of a, a picture like this you see in the middle and a color coding system is used to denote, denote whether uh, the protection for each body region is good adequate marginal weak or poor and this color coding is based on the readings from the dummy instrumentation so if you take um, the head for example the head acceleration of 72 g or less means that the loading on the head wasn't too bad so the head will get a green color if that's the case if the loading is more than 88 g on the head uh and cap euro and cap will color the head of the dummy red which means a bad level of protection so this color coding scheme is very useful and um, because it gives you a snapshot of the protection offered to different parts of the body um, in the crash now consumer tests can be different um, not just between regions around the world but also within the same region so for example let's have a look at us ncap the us new car assessment program they assess the safety of the vehicle in a rollover crash euro ncap does not and this is probably something to do with the fact that in the US, in North America, rollovers account for about 20% of fatal crashes, whereas in Europe, it's only about 4%. But in the US, US NCAP will do um, a static test of the vehicle to assess its rollover potential, where they relate the uh, track width of the vehicle between the wheels and the height of the vehicle bumper from the ground into an index which can predict its rollover potential. They also do a dynamic test. It's a slalom test where the vehicle undergoes rapid turning maneuvers uh, to try and tip it up basically. And the, the amount the wheels uh, come off the ground in the slalom maneuver indicates how stable the vehicle would be and its rollover risk. As I say, we don't run that kind of test in Europe. So you won't find any figures for European cars in Europe in terms of its rollover risk assessment the insurance institute for highway safety in the us uh, runs an offset frontal impact uh, where only part of the vehicle front is impacted by the crash barrier uh, us ncap does not do a test like that it only runs fully overlapping concrete block barrier so even within the same country uh, the different consumer groups will run different tests. The Insurance Institute for Highway Safety in the US also has a more severe side impact than the one used by US NCAP. Uh, the barrier is heavier, the barrier is higher, uh, it uses smaller dummies in the car to assess a worst case scenario. But again, this is indicative of uh, one country with two separate consumer test programs running different test programs. So. The point is here, if you were buying a car in the United States, you would not just look at US NCAP scores for safety, you would also look at the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety scores as well. So how do you choose the safest vehicle? Well, um, what you might do first is look at the overall safety rating of a vehicle, uh, generally den denoted by a star system. Uh, these are fairly similar around the world uh, and here is a, a an example from euro ncap just to give you an idea of how it works now imagine you're in the market for a small family hatchback uh, and you're looking at the fiat punto 2017 model and the hyundai i30 both costs the same both have the same specification but have a look at the safety ratings because they're very different uh, the fiat the hyundai i30 has a five star 
occupant safety rating. So that means it's uh, it's a very safe vehicle. The Fiat Punto has no stars. Now, you have to be careful when you look at these overall ratings because they're not just based on occupant safety. They may also be based on child safety, pedestrian safety, and on active safety fit features and fitment. So to have a look at the occupant safety individually, um, you might drill down a little bit and look here. And you can see that the adult occupant safety for the Fiat Punto is 51% whereas it's 88% for the Hyundai i30, which means that adult occupants should be much, much safer in the Hyundai. Often the um, individual body region risk is presented in a color coding scheme, as I said earlier on, and here are two examples which show a comparison between drivers and passengers for the Fiat Punto and the Hyundai i30. Now, what you can see here is that in the frontal offset test, the um, driver protection in the Fiat Punto is fairly similar to the driver protection in the Hyundai i30. The colors on the dummy are fairly similar. The passenger in the Punto is not so well protected because you can see it has, uh, the passenger here has an orange colored chest, which means that protection for the chest was only marginal. Whereas in the Hyundai i30, the chest is yellow for the front passenger, which means there was adequate protection, better protection. Now, in the full width impact, which is an additional crash test that Euro NCAP runs, you can see that uh, the big difference between the Hyundai i30 and the Fiat comes in terms of protection for the rear passenger. Now, the rear passenger in the Fiat Punto has a brown chest which means that there's very weak protection in that occupant seating position, whereas the rear passenger in the Hyundai has a yellow chest, much, much better chest protection. Other differences in terms of whiplash protection, you can see here the neck is red in the Fiat Punto, which means poor whiplash protection is provided, whereas the neck is green for the front seat passengers in the Hyundai, which means good neck protection. So this kind of information can give you a little bit more detail on exactly how the vehicle performs in a crash and how safe it would be in a real world impact. Now, of course, you also want to look at the safety features that are provided by the uh, vehicle manufacturer. And down here on the left, you can see the most important interior restraint systems in the vehicle. Uh, and whether or not they're provided for the driver, the passenger, the front seat passenger, and the rear seat passenger. Now, ideally, you would want a green mark in all of these um, in all of these squares. Uh, quite often, you don't, but some cars are better than others. So, if you look at the uh, Fiat Punto, for example, it provides an airbag for the driver and passenger, the same as the Hyundai. It provides a belt pretension and load limiter for the driver and front seat passenger, but not for the rear occupants. Whereas the Hyundai does provide a belt pretension and load limiter for the rear occupants. The airbag for the driver in the Fiat is not available. In the Hyundai, you can get an e-airbag fitted as an option. A major difference between these two vehicles and one which might sway your buying decision concerns the fitment of side airbag protection. In the Hyundai, side airbags are included as standard for the driver and front seat passenger, whereas they're an option on the Fiat. So an examination of the uh, equipment fitted to the vehicle can also uh, inform your decision on, on whether to buy the car or not. Uh, different Rating systems are used around the world, but more more often than not, they rely on similar kinds of technique, uh, a star rating system or a color coding system. Here is the US NCAP safety rating for the 2015 Ford Focus. Uh, stars are given for occupant protection in different types of crash for drivers and passengers. And you can see that the Ford Focus gets five stars for most of the uh, crash test scenarios. Apart from the front seat passenger, 
in the frontal impact who only gets four out of five stars. So they, they, they found some issues there. And the rollover star rating, which only gets four out of five stars. So the car is reasonably safe in a rollover, but not completely safe. Euro NCAP, sorry, US NCAP don't provide color coded uh, dummy pictures for you to look at. They do provide the raw output from the dummy in supporting documents, though. And the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety, IHS, here you can see um, use a similar color coding scheme to Euro NCAP. Uh, only four categories instead of five, though good, acceptable, marginal, and poor. Um, and what you can see here in the um, moderate overlap frontal impact, for example, uh, occupants are well protected, it gets a good rating. In a side impact, occupants are well protected, it gets a good rating. And here you can see the breakdown of the body region protection uh, in a moderate overlap frontal crash. Uh, the body regions here on the left and over on the right side, the color coded rating for those. So these are the kinds of information you will see if you examine the consumer crash test ratings for uh, various vehicles around the world. Now, as I said right at the beginning, we need more rigorous crash testing in order to improve matters still further, especially since most of the safety rating systems are based on uh, crash test uh, scenarios. So one fundamental question to ask is, can a limited number of highly stylized, repeatable crash test procedures hope to cover the whole range of crashes and people that are associated with the, the real world of traffic crashes? Well, some types of impact are not assessed at all. Uh, and here's a good example of that, a side impact with a difference. Now, the side impact test uh, that's, that's used around the world usually assesses impact to the side on which the occupant is sitting. But if you look at real world statistics, 30% of seriously injured occupants in side impact are seated on the side opposite to the impact. So in this case, the impact here is onto the, that side of the car and the occupant is sitting on the opposite side. Now, the reason people are injured in those types of crash are because the restraint system doesn't work very well. And so you move out of the diagonal section of the seat belt towards the impact point. If the door is intruding a little bit, your head, neck, chest might hit the door and you can sustain serious injuries in that configuration. Now, there is no crash test. There is no assessment procedure to uh, define vehicle safety in this type of impact. Some manufacturers like General Motors have started to fit an airbag in the seat back, which inflates in this type of crash. And this is designed to stop the occupant moving sideways. But these are rare um, and probably they won't become more common until we see a crash test, whether a legal or a consumer requirement for this type of impact. Now, one other issue uh, that is still quite an important challenge for crash safety is something called compatibility. Now, compatibility uh, really means uh, what happens when two cars of different size, different stiffness, and different geometry, different structural heights collide with each other. The important point to note uh, when you examine crash test ratings is that crash tests only assess the protection of vehicles uh, in collision with another vehicle of similar mass. If you drive a vehicle into a, a, an immovable crash barrier, that's what you're doing. It won't predict how the vehicle will perform if it hits something of a different mass, for example, as you can see in, in the bottom picture. And now to prove that this mass is an issue, let's have a look at a, a case example. Here's a Toyota Yaris in a Euro NCAP offset frontal crash it receives five stars for occupant safety. And you can see why the passenger compartment is completely intact, there's no deformation, plenty of room for the occupant to move inside the car before hitting anything. Now here on the right is the same car, a Toyota Yaris, in a 64 kilometer per hour impact into a slightly heavier car, a Toyota Camry, traveling in the opposite direction. Uh, I think, uh, it's fairly obvious that the passenger compartment on the Toyota Yaris has collapsed significantly 
and this uh, would lead to serious injuries in, in a real crash. Now, the main issue here is the fact that the two vehicles are different masses. A heavier vehicle usually comes off better in a crash like that. Uh, these are the safety ratings you would calculate uh, using the Euro NCAP crash test and the real world crash test on the right. And you can see that the protection to the body regions is significantly worse in the real world crash. So this is an issue that really needs to be considered um, when you're choosing a car, that the crash test and therefore some of the safety ratings are based on a situation that assesses impact into another car of similar weight. Euro NCAP are trying to address uh, this compatibility issue. In 2020, they will introduce a different type of frontal impact test, one where the barrier is also moving. So the car and barrier are both moving towards each other, and this should go some way to uh, make the test more realistic uh, of, a, of a real world impact. Now, I mentioned incompatibility of vehicle geometries. This uh, is most important in side impact, where you see here the picture on the left shows a, a sport utility vehicle with a very high vehicle frame hitting a saloon car where the, the major rigid structure in the side is quite low, the sill down here. So the two rigid structures don't match up. So you have a big heavy vehicle, rigid front structure, which is coming halfway up this very weak uh, door, remember, um, directly at the occupant. Now, this is, a, this is an issue which still needs to be solved as well um, in terms of side impact protection. And of course, we don't assess all types of occupant. The older occupants are particularly at risk in crashes um, because of their reduced tolerance to crash loads. What you can see in this slide is the chest injury rate in frontal crashes for people of different ages. And the gray bars actually show you the chest injury risk, the serious chest injury risk, life-threatening chest injuries. And what you can see is that elderly people over the age of 65 have a, a risk of 8% compared to younger people uh, who are up to the age of 40 with a, a risk of only 1%. So in this sense, the elderly are eight times more at risk of serious injury. Uh, in this type of crash. And that's something we, we need to attend to as well because that's not addressed very well in safety assessment systems. The reason, of course, is that um, bone mass, bone strength declines as we get older. Um, here you see a graph of skeletal mass against age. Skeletal mass is a good representation of skeletal bone strength. And up to the age of 30, uh, we're getting stronger. But after that, uh, our strength tails off and our bones become weaker and more porous. And basically that reduces our, our robustness and our ability to withstand crash forces. Now, one of the questions is whether crash testing can assess this situation. Uh, crash test dummies um, move uh, like a 40-year-old person. They don't move like a 60-year-old person or a 70-year-old person. And in addition, the criteria we set for safety probably doesn't reflect the risk of injury for older people. What you can see here are, are two risk curves, one for elderly cadavers and one for the hybrid three crash test dummy. Um, these risk curves are based on, a, on an index system called the CTI or combined thoracic index, which provides an index of chest injury risk based on how much the chest is compressed and what the chest acceleration is. Now an index of one, was the suggested chosen limit for crash testing. But in terms of the hybrid dummy that's used, that limit of one equates to a 10% risk of serious, sorry, uh, there's the limit of one there, a 5% risk of serious chest injury. But when you use elderly uh, specimens like cadavers, that limit of one equates to a 20% risk of serious chest injury. So. The bottom line is, I know it's a little bit complicated, but the bottom line here is that the limits we set for safety may not be totally applicable to older people in car crashes. So in conclusion, uh, I think um, it's fair to say that consumer safety tests are uh, probably the best, most easily accessible measures of vehicle safety. 
Uh, consumer tests certainly have resulted in significant improvements to <coughs> occupant protection in crashes uh, in the last 30 years or so. And if you buy the safest cars in the class, it can pay real significant dividends in terms of occupant safety. However, it has to be said that laboratory crash testing does have some limitations uh, when you compare it to real world situations. But some of the test programs now are trying to develop ways to address those limitations. Thank you, Richard. We've now come to the end of the formal presentations and I'd like to welcome any questions. We've had a number of questions submitted throughout the presentations, which I will put to the panel. It's not too late to submit a question. Please either raise your hand and we'll unmute you or submit your question via the chat box. Hi, Richard and Julian. Just to let you know now that your microphones are on, um, so the attendees of our webinar can now hear um, the answers to the questions which you've kindly sent in. Um, can you hear me okay, Julian and Richard? Yes, I can. Brilliant, great. Yes, I, I um, can as well, Sarah. Yeah. Fab, great. So the first question we've got for you um, is, what are the dangers or consequences for a driver not wearing a seatbelt when an airbag is activated? Um, yeah, good. Um, maybe I'll, I'll jump in and, and Richard, you can tidy up what I miss out. <clears throat> sure, Jolly, sure, go ahead. Um, question, though. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, so I think it, it, it kind of differs as to the, the crash configuration and exactly what we're talking about. So that's a bit of a hand-waving introduction. But I think that um, the, the major point is that you risk not being contained very well um, within the vehicle. And when you start moving around, then you expose yourself to a lot of risks that might not have been kind of designed into the performance, the safety performance of the vehicle. Um, Richard talked about being ejected and how your seatbelt can hold you in. So that's pretty key to what some of the functions that a seatbelt offers. Um, in the U US, in the United States, they had this idea that um, airbags could be designed to be used instead of a seatbelt. And that is quite a neat solution for those people who refuse to belt up in certain crash configurations. Um, however, if you've bought a car that's been designed that the airbag supplements the seatbelt, then if you take away either one of those components, either the airbag because it doesn't work or because the seatbelt, if you didn't buckle it up, then you're um, kind of degrading the, the safety that's offered to you. You're not going to be in the right place at the right time for the other part of the safety system to, to deal with that, that crash. So you're, you'll go too far, you'll go through the airbag, you'll have a very severe head contact with something perhaps, and, and that can be injurious. Um, so I think given that we're talking about, you know, some assumptions that we might be talking about a European car and a reasonably moderate kind of um, crash scenario that's perhaps a frontal impact, then the answer to that is you risk not engaging well with the airbag and trying to make it do to do more more work than it was really intended to do. The consequence is that you you hit things harder than you should have otherwise. Mm. Mm. Um, can I chip in here, Sarah? Yes, go for it. Um, I agree with everything Jolyon has said. Um, just like to add the fact that uh, as US airbags are designed for unbelted occupant, uh, they tend to be much larger than European airbags. Um, I think a driver airbag in the United States is around about 70 litres or so. In a European car, it would be somewhere around maybe 40. And as they are bigger and more powerful, uh, US vehicles tend to have um, systems which can depower the airbag if the occupant in the car is in the wrong position. So if the occupant's sitting too close to the airbag, there are systems in US vehicles, which will reduce its deployment power. Um, we tend not to have those in Europe because our bags are smaller and because they're designed, as Jolyon said, to work with a seat belted occupant. Um, 
I think I can only add uh, something to say the system is designed in Europe for belted occupants, so you should really wear the seat belt all the time. Brilliant, thanks very much to both of you there. Um, Jolene, I've got a question specifically for you. Um, so what passive safety system do you think has been most influenced by crash testing as it has developed? Oh, wow, um, that's a lovely question to answer. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, I, I, I don't know where to start with that. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the obvious answer is that something that restrains an occupant inside a, a car is, is kind of the, the, the crash testing is a fundamental step to, to its kind of requirement and development. So I'm tempted to say that we've taken strides with um, occupant restraint systems that all come down to somebody thinking about some crash tests and somebody doing some testing um, along the way to see what can be done to keep a person tucked up in a in a collision. But given some of the kind of research work that's gone on around the, the changes in vehicle structures since um, crash tests were introduced in Europe at kind of the turn of the century, I might just have to say that the most obvious thing that strikes me every time I see a new car crash tested is just the structure of the vehicle and and the way that they manage that energy is truly amazing these days. So um, I, I'm torn in how to answer that. Um, the biomechanics person in me loves how restraint systems work, but the just the, the kind of um, awe and wonder of seeing a modern car crash and, and its structure remain broadly intact around the occupant, I think that probably trumps it. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and a question for you, Richard. Um, there are a range of consumer crash testing programmes across the world. Is there a way for fleet managers to identify which of these programmes provide the best or most reliable safety overview of the vehicle that they are seeking to purchase? Um, for an example, um, specific component tests, that should be standard. Hmm. That's also a, a very good question. Um, I think the first thing I'd say really is you, you have to look at the, the country or region in which you're buying the vehicle. Um, there are uh, some, well, several vehicles that are sold both in Europe and the US, Volkswagen Golf, for example, um, that on, would undergo European consumer tests and US consumer tests. The thing here that's really important is that if you're buying the Golf in the US, you wouldn't want to look at the European um, consumer test results uh, other than for some interest because the car will be fitted with probably, well, not probably, it will definitely have a different restraint system when it's sold in the US compared to Europe. Uh, it may even have structural differences compared to a European vehicle. So. Mm -hmm. The European test on the Golf wouldn't predict how the US version performs. So basically, you need to look at the um, tests that relate to the country in which you're buying the vehicle. Um, that's the first thing. Um, as for which which are the best, uh, well, um, as, as you saw in my presentation, different consumer programs use different tests and, and they all really assess different things. So it's really difficult to say which are the best. Um, personally, if you want my uh, professional opinion, I think Euro NCAP, um, because of the scope of the tests it does, um, yeah. provides the most comprehensive um, information for car buyers. Great. Um, that actually leads me very nicely onto the next question, which we've got sent in. Um, the Euro NCAP guide has color-coded dummies for different parts of the body. Um, and one of our attendees has, has asked, what does the white coloured body parts represent? Oh, <laughs> the white coloured parts. Um, I have to be honest here, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I can only imagine that it's uh, it, it represents uh, something that wasn't actually tested. Okay. Um, we can ask Jolyon if he, if he knows more. I, I don't um, actually think it means anything, to be honest. Yeah. I, I... I'm not entirely sure either. I'm just trying to quickly flick back to a picture <laughs> where we've got one. Um, 
Yes, I, I think that that's it right. So it's um uh, an uninstrumented part of the body, so mm. so to speak. So it it's um kind of saying that they don't have information to advise about risk of injury to that body part. Um, it's not because that body part is free of injury. It's just that the the testing doesn't offer any information about it. I think that's why it's white. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Gillian, you mentioned that seatbelt tensioner stand load limiters are not available as options to buy per se. Um, is this technology widely available on the market? And if so, how can you find out whether or not a vehicle has been fitted with it? That, that's a, yeah, that's lovely, and and I'm really happy that um, Richard covered this in in his presentation that followed after mine. So he gave this example where you, if you dig down into the detail of Euro NCAP, you can in fact they they have tick boxes or or green dots um, to show whether the presence of one of those systems, a pretensioner or a seatbelt load limiter. And you can check for the driver and for the passenger and whether they're present in the rear seats. So it is, in fact, possible to see whether your vehicle is equipped with those systems via the Euro NCAP website. Um, so, so that, um, to some extent, is available for the, the popular cars that are tested. Um, how common they are, um, I would say they're almost routinely fitted for um front seat positions these days and what we had for the rear seats is that they were ex almost exclusively not fitted there until quite recently and what happened was with the introduction of the um full width test in euro ncap they had the option of putting a an occupant in a rear seat and the the power of doing that meant that some of the um, restraint system features that we saw only in the front seats very quickly migrated to the rear seats of new cars. And so I think it's becoming much more commonplace now to find it pretensioners and load limiters fitted universally throughout all seating positions in, yeah, in, in many new cars. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another question that we've got in um, is from Jim, who would like to know what um, the panel's view is um, on the lack of cra crash testing and crash rating of commercial vehicles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, w w uh, I guess my view is that um, I, I would like to see it, but that's mm -hmm. me talking from um, from the point of view and, and the point of mind that it would be useful information and from a safety perspective I think it could do do something to drive safety improvements however that completely negates the other side of the argument that says um, th that driving that is perhaps counterproductive to the way the industry needs to operate um, for, for kind of business and commercial reasons so uh, I'm mindful that expressing my wishes here that mm -hmm. we, we, we test as much as possible it needs a suitable caveat to say yeah that may not stand up to kind of a, a cost benefit um, analysis if, if you like um, but but personally I think the more information we can generate the the better and safer mm -hmm. our, our vehicles will be. Mm. I, I think um... If I could just add to that, Sarah, um, I, I'm not quite sure what the um, what the question means by commercial vehicles, whether it's a big, heavy 16 wheel truck or, or, or you know, just um, a heavy van. But um, apart from the uh, self-protection issues uh, in those vehicles, uh, the compatibility issue that I raised um, in my presentation uh, are very important as well. So any um, testing or assessment of commercial vehicle safety would really have to consider the safety of the cars and occupants of those cars that were struck by the vehicle as well as the safety inside the commercial vehicle. Basically because they're bigger and heavier than, than passenger cars. Um, so in both of your presentations, the data on vulnerable road users 
um, largely focused on pedestrian crash safety and testing. Um, are there any passive systems or crash tests that you feel are particularly beneficial for protecting cyclists from fleet vehicles on the roads? Um, if Richard, you could answer that first. Uh, I'll try, Sarah. Um, <laughs> well, uh, currently, uh, I think the, um, the best approach to safety of, of bicycles uh, comes with active safety systems um, and crash avoidance technologies. And I know it's quite difficult to detect um, slim vehicles like bicycles and motorcycles for that matter. And there are moves afoot to develop or in development systems which can detect uh, small vehicles like that and apply um, autonomous emergency braking. But uh, I think uh, active safety is probably going to give the biggest bang for the buck in terms of um, cyclist protection. Julian, would you like to add any points further to that? Uh, maybe. I, I think Richard's 100% um, going to correct with that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that if we were um, pushed as to what, what could happen um, to uh, help um, with pedal cyclists rather than pedestrians, mm -hmm. I, I think you would probably put a bit more emphasis on um, protection around the windscreen area of, of cars and yeah. kind of a high up um, given that a, a pedal cyclist might travel a bit further if, if they were hit which we hope to avoid as Richard mentioned mm -hmm. if they were hit by by a car they would go f a bit further up the vehicle um, so the emphasis might change a little bit in, in where the passive protection goes um, we we struggle with with the windscreen and the surrounding areas because it's difficult to make big improvements there it's got a lot of other reasons for being stiff for instance if it's the a pillar um but it, it might put a little bit more emphasis on on those regions of the vehicle yeah. but but I, I agree with richard that avoiding the collision in the first place is is yeah. going to be the best thing to do mm -hmm. and so just to explore that a bit further um, you both mentioned how consumer information is limited, so buyers have to rely on vehicle specifics and choosing vehicles by the presence or absence of key components um, for buses and trucks. So with that in mind, what do you consider to be the single most important feature to mitigate the effects of a crash involving A, pedestrians and B, cyclists? Um, well, I... I <laughs> Uh, basically the same as my answer to the last question. I think yeah. um, for me at least, uh, avoidance of the impact um, would be the most important um, area to, to look at for future development. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, and I um, echo that again. I think if I was looking through an, a tick box exercise of saying, does the vehicle have this or not, then I think a system that um, detected vulnerable road user and tried to avoid the impact an A, B system for, for those road users would be number one thing to look for. Um, I think when the, by the time you get to having a, a collision with, with that vulnerable road user, it's far more subjective as to which bit you should focus on. Um, I think it's really not that clear that you would choose one over another. Mm -hmm. um, that gets to be quite a difficult question. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think happy with what Richard said there. Brilliant. Although, although, although in terms of what you mentioned earlier, Jolly, and some of the pedestrian protection passive systems, um, under bonnet airbags, for example, might help a little. Uh, I know some of the Volvo systems, the airbag um, wraps around the base of the A pillar, the stiff stiff windscreen surround a little bit, which may um, go some way to mitigating the effects of an impact if should it occur yeah yeah you, yeah of course you're right yeah brilliant um that is all, that's all our questions um, for today and um, i'd just like to say a huge thank you um to you both julian and richard and um, that was some great answers to some very specific questions i really appreciate um your input today um so julian and richard i'm just going to put your microphones back on mute um, just okay. so we can wrap up the webinar and we'll speak to you again soon. Okay, Thank thanks. You.
Thank you. Bye. Bye. We'll be sending you all an online feedback form following today's event, and we would really appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete that for us. We've got a full programme of events taking place throughout 2018. On screen now, you can see our next scheduled webinars. We're also taking bookings for our annual Fleet Safety Conference and our 2018 Fleet Safety Awards are open for entries. Please visit our Break Professional website for more information or email professional at break.org.uk. That just leaves me to say thank you to the speakers and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>